think there's no better way, talking about remaining in God or Him in us, than the Eucharist. continuing our fourth Mass uh, in a row that is a Mass for special needs, in particular the Mass for the Church, as we continue uh, this uh, being a ferial day that we um, are going to finish our, our fourth um, a homily here on the fullness, why the Catholic Church has the fullness of the truth. And it's beautiful to end this um, series of homilies and Masses for the Church with a talk on the Eucharist. And our Lord says, you must remain in me, and I will remain, and you will bear the fruit if you remain in me. And um, I, I think there's no better way, talking about remaining in God or Him in us, than the Eucharist. The Eucharist is the way that we do that. Literally, uh, He remains in us. It's, a, it's the wedding feast of the Lamb, and it's consummation. What happens in the marriage? The, the marriage is consummated. Christ, the bridegroom, enters the bride. The bridegroom enters the bride. The two become one. And in this case, who's the bridegroom? Christ. Who's the bridegroom? Us, the church. And so it's the beautiful, it's the beautiful relationship in the wedding feast of the Lamb. So now, all of this reading is, is from John. Part of my favorite reference on the Eucharist is John chapter 6, uh, verse 53 through 58. I've, I've talked about it a couple times. And it's a beautiful um, uh, discourse on the Eucharist. And when we talk about the Eucharist, I think it's so important because we always relate it to the Mass. You don't, without the Mass, you don't have the Eucharist, and without the Eucharist, you don't have the Mass. It's what we do together. It's, it brings us that food, the food for the soul. You know, our, our bodies need food every day. We'd be crazy to think that our souls don't need food every day. So it reminds me of a story. Um, when I was down in North Carolina, uh, when I first started my business, uh, if you've ever been a business owner, you know, short of selling your soul, You'll do anything to get a contract to uh, keep your business going. And um, we, it was right after 9-11, times were very tough, and we were trying to get new business, and there was a, a potential really big client that <clears throat> I had struck a relationship with, so he invited me to his evangelical church on a Wednesday night service to come down. And I didn't know I was walking into an ambush. <laughs> and uh, so anyway, he knew I was Catholic, but he was a very good man. And um, so I get there to the Wednesday night service, and I walk in, and, and my, my colleague there, or my, the guy I was working with, the potential client, says, welcome, I'm going to come and introduce you to everybody. So he says, Pastor Jim. He says, this is Father, or uh, excuse me, Chris at the time, this is Chris. And um, I walked in, and there was a bunch of people around, and, and he says, I'd like you to meet Pastor Jim, and he comes over, and he says, this is Chris, and he's Catholic. <laughs> All the buddy, God love them, they all came around and laying hands on me, praying over me, trying to deliver me from this being a Catholic thing. And I, what struck me with it was the, the, the pastor was a good man, and he said, welcome, Chris. He says, uh, you know, and, and it was a very plain uh, hall of worship. You know, it was white walls, and there was nothing, there was no altar, just a chair. And he says, welcome to our church. We don't have all those rituals. We don't have all that, the robes and altars and candles and smoke. Who knows what that smoke's for? You know? <laughs> and, uh, and, and I thought it was unique because it was that night they were talking about the book of Revelation. And they were talking about the book of Revelation and how it was about the Antichrist and about rap, the rapture. And he says, this is, you know, welcome. We're going to talk about our Bible study tonight, the book of Revelation the Antichrist and the rapture. And he just finished talking about, we don't have all those rituals and robes and all that. I had not yet listened to Scott Hahn's talk on the Lamb's Supper. 
And it's amazing how God works because soon as I listened to Scott Hahn's talk on the Lamb Supper, this event came back to my mind. Because here's what happened. When we were talking about the Antichrist and the rapture, he said, we don't have all those things. I listened to Scott Hahn, and he gives this beautiful synopsis. And he talks about, really? You don't have all those rituals? Those things are no good, though? Let's look at the book of Revelation. First of all, the priesthood is in the book of Revelation. Chapter 20, verse 6. And it also talks about celibacy. The celibacy of the priest, which is uniquely Catholic, is in the book of Revelation, chapter 14, 4. It goes on. There's a high priest wearing a robe, chasm. Candles are talked about. Chapter 1, verse 13. He mentions that in the book of Revelation, John, there is an altar. There is a censer. You know what a censer is? During a solemn mass, it's the gold vessel that they put incense in, they light it, and they swing it, and the smoke comes out. It's just the exact same thing as what all that smoke is for. I don't know. Now, it says in the book of Revelation, the incense rises up and mingles with the prayers of the saints. Ooh, saints. Another uniquely Catholic thing. Don't believe me? Chapter 8, verse 3 and 4. The Eucharist is mentioned. It's the hidden manna, which is bread from heaven. Chapter 2, verse 17. In the Mass, we hear holy, holy, holy. It's in Revelation, chapter 4, verse 8. We hear about alleluia. I just sing it so beautifully, right? <laughs> chapter 19, verse 1. The Gloria, which we sing on Sunday Mass. Chapter 19, verse 1. Canticles, acclamations, they're all present, just like our Mass. Participants stand, kneel, and bow. Sounds like the Catholic Mass. It's funny because we have the penitential rite in the Mass. That's in the book of Revelation. We are called to repent. In the book of Revelation, the Lamb of God. We say it here at the altar. Three times the Lamb of God. 28 times in the book of Revelation. There are altars. There are books. There are chalices. The white robes, saints are mentioned. The sacrifice of the Lamb to the Father. What is the Mass? The sacrifice of the Lamb to the Father. Who's the Lamb? Jesus. Jesus Christ. Interesting. Now, Scott talks about the book of Revelation being broken into two parts, two main parts. The first part is chapters 1 through 11. And he points out that it is exactly like our liturgy of the Word. Our Mass is broken into two parts. Liturgy of the Word and Liturgy of the Eucharist. The Liturgy of the Word is like the book of Revelation, chapters 1 through 11. Listen to what happens in the book of Revelation in chapters 1 through 11. The high priest emerges at the altar and goes to the book to reveal its contents. You know, on Sunday Mass, they have the Gospel. We go to the altar, we take the book, we bring it, and we open it to reveal its contents. Now, the second half of the Mass is like the second half of the book of Revelation. Chapters 13 through 22 are like the liturgy of the Eucharist. Jesus stands at the altar wearing vestments. The people are fed manna. And here's the amazing one. The contents of the chalices. They are seven chalices filled with wine, and they are turned into blood. Does that sound familiar? The Catholic Mass. The Catholic Mass. So the, the contents of these chalices are poured out, and they are turned, the wine is turned into blood. As Scott Haas says, it's all there. The Mass is on every page of the book of Revelation. It's not about the, the rapture or the Antichrist. It's about the Mass. The vessel of our salvation is the church. And it's the Mass that we celebrate here. He says if we make it to Mass, we make it to heaven. Christ is present here and now in heaven and on earth at the Mass. You know, the saints tell us that at the Mass, the roof of the church actually opens up. And the angels, right? They come down and they descend down, the angels and the saints, and they, 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 they 
union of heaven and earth actually happens at the mass. It's like the roof opening up and, and the, the, the angels coming down and uniting with us being here. And I've said this before, but I think it's so beautiful. Um, some of the, 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 the mystic writings that we have uh, in the church from some of our saints and mystics talk about your guardian angels all come and kneel in front of the altar at the moment of consecration. And they're holding a vessel. And what's in that vessel? What you put into it. That's what's being offered to God on the altar. That's why when I hold up at the concluding doxology, the patent in the chalice, we're offering through the sacrifice of Jesus back to the Father. Put everything on that chalice. Put your hopes, your dreams, your sufferings, your sorrows on that and offer it back to God through the sacrifice of the Son. Your guardian angels are here, gathered around the altar. Whatever's in that vessel is what you put into it. But I don't get nothing out of the Mass. Well, try putting something into it. That may make a whole difference in your life. And that's what we have in the Mass, is what we put into it and we receive that life-giving manna back to us through Holy Communion. You know, it's funny because we talk about the, the rapture of the Antichrist, but that's not how the Church Fathers saw it. The church fathers saw the book of Revelation as the Mass. Remember, John says, unless in the Bible that he quotes Jesus, is unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you. The sacrifice lamb in the Old Testament Passover had to be eaten, or the sacrifice in the first child would die, it would be invalid. Now, the sacrifice of the lamb is Christ. He is to be eaten. This is what our faith is. And the sacrifice of the lamb at Passover and the sacrifice of the mass are the same. You know, the church fathers saw it this way. The mass has more scripture in it than any Protestant Sunday worship. Yes. That is so powerful. We read from the Bible. All the prayers of the mass are scripturally based. It's so beautiful. And we have all that. You know, when you look at God's three great acts of mercy, creation, redemption, and sanctification or justification or divinization, it's in the Mass. Remember we talk about the three members of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. God the Father, the first member of the Trinity. What do we normally attribute to Him? Creation. God the Father, all comes from God. He spoke the word. All was created. God the Father created. Then, in the second great act of mercy. That was the first great act of mercy, uh, creation. Then in the second great act of mercy, the second person of the Trinity, God saw our suffering after sin and decided to do something about it. What did he do? He sent his son. The second person of the Trinity in the second great act of mercy came down, became man, and redeemed us. Now, is all of mankind redeemed? Yes. yes. Will all of mankind be saved? No. no, because some will reject that gift. You are here to receive that gift. Now, in the third and final and greatest act of mercy, through the power of the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, we will be united back to God the Father through the sacrifice of the Son. The power of the Holy Spirit, resurrected Christ, offers the sacrifice. We are turned back to the Father for all eternity. When does that happen? Symbolically on the eighth day. Eight represents eternity. Divine Mercy Sunday is the eighth day of the Easter octave. So beautiful. So the great acts of mercy, creation, redemption, justification, or divinization are all the gifts God gives us in his mercy. And where are they typified? When does this happen? Where are we divinized? Some people say in our baptism, absolutely. We begin to share the divine nature. Some people say at our death, absolutely, because you behold the beatific vision. But where does that divinization, that third great act of mercy, happen every day? Here at the Mass. You are sharing in the divine nature through Holy Communion. That is the gift that God gives us. This is our faith. This is why the Catholic Church has the fullness of the truth. Not to discredit any others but not to put our head in the sand and walk away and jump off the vessel that God gave us for our salvation.